are continuing our series Thrive, and this morning's message is deeply rooted in relationship, and we're reading from Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, if you'll turn with me there, Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, and our message this morning is deeply rooted in relationship. You know, last week we spoke about the fact that almost all plants have a taproot that grows vertically deep down to access water and nutrients to sustain the life and growth of that plant. The taproot remains the largest central root of the plant from which other roots grow. But after about two years, most trees have a large system of horizontal roots. So they have the main tap root that's vertical, but then they grow a a system of horizontal roots that grow out from the tap root and are as wide as the canopy of the tree. So if the tree canopy is 40 feet wide, the root system below is 40 feet wide. These lateral roots absorb water and minerals to nourish the tree, they stabilize the tree, and they also help the the plant to to reproduce fruit and and, and leaves and what have you. And as we saw last week, that taproot is an image of how we need to be deeply rooted in Christ. That's the vertical root. That's our relationship with God through Christ. But we also need those horizontal or lateral roots. Along with our vertical vertical connection with God, we need strong horizontal connections with God's people. And that's a repeated theme of scripture, which is even further emphasized by the terms that God uses to describe his church. He calls us uh, the fellowship of the saints. The fellowship of the saints. That talks about relationship. It talks about sharing the common life. He talks about uh, uh, the church being the family of God about being the body of Christ and each member of the body being vitally connected to one another, interdependent on each other. So all of these terms, these images that God uses to describe the church emphasize that relational connection. And here again in Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, that is the emphasis. In Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, it says, instead, because he's connecting to the previous verses and he's talking about instead of being spiritually immature and easily moved by every wind of doctrine. He says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You see, growing in our relationship with Christ does not happen alone. We need one another. And this is not just some preacher saying that. This is the Lord saying that in his word. The church is not man's idea, it's God's idea. One writer says, if we take the Bible seriously, commitment to and participation in the church is not optional. Why? Because Jesus himself established the church as a necessary institution for the good of his people. Though he knew he would finish his work and depart for a time, he never intended to let his sheep fend for themselves in his absence and do life alone. This author goes on to write, the church is his body, and he is the head from which the rest of the body is nourished. Taken together, to separate from the church is to separate from Christ the head. To be a churchless Christian is to be a decapitated Christian. That's quite the image. But the metaphor of the body is to emphasize that individual Christians need to be connected to other individual Christians. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, they all depend upon each other. He goes on to say, God designed it this way. We need to connect. We need community. We need to walk through life with others by our side. And God provides for those needs to be met through his church through his church do you know that every sunday in america 120 million people will attend a church service that's more than all the people combined who will attend a major sporting event for an entire year worldwide over two billion people are a member of a church family somewhere in the world now why do they do this what is their motivation What are the benefits that they get that keeps them coming back? Why get out of bed and go to church, especially on a chilly morning, when it would be much easier to stay at home? How would you answer the question? 
why do you go to church? Did you know the majority of the people who attend church couldn't give a clear answer as to why they go to church? And if some of you were asked, why are you a part of a church family? What reasons would you give? That's an important question, especially for a whole generation of millennials and Gen Zers, the majority of whom do not see any relevance to the church and are anti-institutional. We need to know why being a part of the church is important before we can effectively invite and encourage others to be a part of the family of God. So it's a question that we really need to consider today that we might realize that God has given us the church as a gift not a burden. It is a gift of his grace to meet our deepest needs, to fulfill our purpose, and to help us grow spiritually. And the first thing we see is the church blesses us with a people to share life with. Blesses us with a people to share life with. The church is not a place, it's a people. We often say things like, I'm going to church. Or we ask people, where do you go to church? Or we define a person's spirituality by whether they go to church or they don't go to church. But the concept the concept of going to church belies a misunderstanding about the church. The church is not a place. The church is a people. Now, we gather as God's people in a place, and it's important to do that. I want to say that again. We gather as God's people in a place... And it's important to do that. That's why Hebrews 10, 25 tells us, let us not neglect our what? Meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What are we supposed to encourage one another to do? To meet together, to be a vital part of the family of God, to share in the fellowship of the body of Christ. And when we gather with God's people, we are encouraged, we are strengthened, we are are inspired. Amen. We are encouraged to know that we are not alone in the world. There are other like-minded people. I watched a show yesterday because it was Holocaust Remembrance and uh, I watched a show on Prime yesterday and it, the title of it was There Are Others Like Us. And it was the story of um, some Jewish people that were in a concentration camp that was mainly for Polish uh, resistors. But there were a few Jewish people among them. And one, one Jewish man that was working in the workshop saw a young lady walking with the other Polish women. They brought them out for about an hour a day in the courtyard. And he saw this young lady walking with the other Polish women, and he recognized that she looked Jewish even though uh, her captors didn't know that. So as she passed near to where he was, he said, there are others like us. She ignored him at first, but several times over and over, he told her there are others like us, meaning we're Jews. And, and they began to form a connection which they needed to support and encourage them in order to be able to survive uh, the concentration camp. But when we come together as the church, we're saying to one another, there are others like us. There are people who love God. There are people who, who stand and live righteous lives, who walk in holiness. Amen. There are people who believe in God. So there are other like-minded people who love the Lord and are living for him. We are encouraged by the testimonies. When we hear somebody share how God got them through a hard time or how God healed them, what does it do? It strengthens our faith. And we say, if God did it for them, he'll do it for me. Amen. We're encouraged by the prayers. Right before the service, I took a call for someone who is in a, a hospital rehab and prayed for them. And as I was praying for them, they were just crying. Prayer is a tremendous encouragement when we pray for one another. Amen. Because sometimes, you know, when you're going through it, you can pray, but you may not feel like praying. But when you know there's somebody else there that's praying with you, it strengthens you and supports you. We're encouraged by the ministry of others. You know, sometimes people minister to us a word of encouragement, or sometimes the gifts of the spirit flow through somebody to us in a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or a prophetic word, word and it just strengthens and encourages our heart. Or maybe somebody ministers to us the gift of helps. They help us in a difficult time or the gift of mercy. They show us compassion. And what does it do? It ministers to our soul. It encourages us. It strengthens us in our being. There's a saying that there is strength in numbers. You ever heard that saying? Amen. 
and we are strengthened in our faith when we come together as the body of Christ. The church is vital to encouraging us to endure faithfully to the end, especially because we are living in the last days. That's why he said, forsake not the fellowshipping of yourselves together as is the habit of some, but rather encourage one another all the more. All the more what? To gather all the more as the end approaches. We need all the more to be together. Just like those uh, Jewish uh, uh, people in the prison encampment in Germany, uh, or in Poland, excuse me, they needed that encouragement of having one another in order to enable them to endure the hard times that they were going through. In these end times, we need the support, the encouragement, the love, the care of one another all the more. Folks, I'll tell you, I have never seen so much suffering and so much hurt as what I've seen people go through over the last two years, even people within our own church body. Some people have lost multiple family members, and it just tears your heart out. We need one another. The days are difficult, and we need one another. We need the church to encourage, to stand up, to, to, to minister, to, to shower love on one another, because that's what gives us the encouragement and strength to go on. The church is vital to us. Life is so much better and so much more fulfilling when we share it with others who are on the same journey as us, the journey of faith. And the church is a loving community growing together in Christ. In 1 Peter 1, 3, I'm reading from the Living Bible. It says, he has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. He has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. Folks, we are not born as orphans. Amen. Naturally, when we're born, we're born into a family. And spiritually, when we are born, we are born into the family of God. The church is not just a service that we attend. It is a loving family that we belong to. And it is the only community that we belong to that will go with us from birth to death throughout this life and into eternity. For folks, guess what? You're not going to get rid of me when we get to heaven. We're still going to know each other and love each other and fellowship with one another. Amen? It's the only community that goes with us throughout life, here on earth, and into eternity. You know, when you go to college, you have your friends, you graduate, you move on, you may keep in touch with them for a while, but life tends to take you in different directions. Amen? You may have a job, you get friends, you hang out together, whatever, then you move on to another job, you may keep in touch with them for a while, but most of the time, you go in different directions. Am I right? But the family of God goes with you throughout life. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. I'm looking out right now and I'm seeing some people who grew up in this church. I knew them from the time they were children. I have not aged, but they have. <laughs> And now they're adults. They're in, in their 30s. Some are in their... <clears throat> and um, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but they have their own careers. They have their own families. And it's such a joy because I've been able to see them go through all of those stages of life and be there with them and for them. Some of them, I've, I've performed their wedding ceremonies, dedicated their babies. Amen. And it's such a joy. Such a joy. We are the family of God. And I've seen the wonderful love of this community when one of our members alone in this country from South Korea was dying of cancer. And this church body banded together to make a 24-hour schedule to have someone always there to care for her and be with her in the final weeks of her life so that she would not die alone. That's the family of God. I have seen the wonderful love of this church family in a children's church worker that made an impact on a child from an abusive family. And though that child has grown up and gone off to college and has not yet committed her life to Christ, she pops into this church whenever she's in town and she wants to see that children's church worker. Why? Because that children's church worker gave her love and stability that she did not have at home. 
That's the family of God, folks. That's the family of God. And when we're a part of a church family, we are loved, we belong, we find strength to endure, and we find encouragement to grow as we speak the truth to one another in love. From the time that we are born, naturally, we are meant to be a family. And from the time that we are born again, we are meant to be a part of a spiritual family, the wonderful church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And the church fulfills one of the deepest needs, the deep need for family and a people to share our life together, to share our life together. You know, my dad, when, when he was not really um, sir, saved and serving the Lord, uh, as a young person, I got saved and, and uh, I filled with the Holy Ghost and called to the ministry. So I wanted to be in church all the time. And he would get upset at me. And he would say to me, why don't you just move your bed on down to the church? This is not a hotel where you just come to sleep. And I would tell him, no, but the church is my fa family. And, and he wouldn't understand. But years later, when I started this church, my dad and mom dedicated their heart to Christ. And, and he began to come on a regular basis. Amen. And uh, he began to build relationships within the people, within the body of Christ. And I remember him one day telling me, he said, now I understand what you meant by the church being your family. He said, because I am closer to some of the people at church than I am to my own family. There were people in this church that called my dad their their dad. They said they felt like he was their dad. And, 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 and that's that family of God, that family of God. And, and when we're a part of a church family, we have a people who will rejoice with us when we rejoice, and they'll weep with us when we re weep, and they will pray with us when we're going through the fire. We have a support system to walk with us and encourage and strengthen us in life's journey. And we also have a people to socialize with in God-honoring activities that make life more fun and enjoyable, because God wants us to enjoy life as well. Well, amen. Life is so much better and so much more fulfilling when we do life together as the family of God. And when we are connected to the family of God, church is so much more than just attending a service. Because just attending a service can become lifeless. It can become routine. But when the church is our family, when we get together, it's a reunion. It's filled with joy. We're connecting with one another. We're catching up on the week. Amen. We're praying for one another, encouraging one another. But it extends beyond a service. When we are the family of God, we are in each other's lives throughout the week. Calling one another, praying with one another, maybe going out for coffee together. Amen. We're part of one another's life. The early church, they met together on Sundays, but then they gathered in each other's homes throughout the week to eat meals together. And that's how the family of God ought to be. So we need to avoid the danger of attending church rather than being the church. Avoid the danger of just attending the church and start being the church. Start becoming a part of the family of God and building those relationships if you have not already done so. And for those who are already doing so, God bless you. You are fulfilling the will and purpose of God. Second principle, being a part of the church family is essential to our spiritual growth. Being a part of a church family helps us to keep God central in our life. We were created to worship him. That is our chief purpose in life. We were created by him. We were created for him to give him glory and honor. 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, Be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. And the word fear there is also translated worship. Be sure to worship the Lord and faithfully serve him. It speaks of a reverential awe and, and, and honor, a respect for God. Isaiah 43, 7 says that we were created to bring him glory. And it's so easy to become distracted from our, our highest purpose by the busyness of life and the worries and troubles that we go through. But when we're a part of a church family, both corporately through the services and personally through the relationships that we build within the body of Christ, we are continually being pointed back to God. And folks, we all need that. 
We all need that. Because as Jesus said, first, the first and most important thing in our life is to love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your might, with everything that is within you. Amen? With all your might. That's the first and most important thing. And it's so easy for things to come in and pull our time and our energy and our affection that belongs first and foremost to him. But these things come in and distract us. But when we are a part of the family of God and we're regularly meeting together for services and meeting together with one another outside of services, we're continually being called back to our focus on God, called back to our first love. And that's so essential. And it's also essential for our witnesses, for our witness to the world. Why? Because Jesus said, by this, by what? By our love for one another, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. The way we love each other is a major part of our witness to the world. In fact, in the early church, when the people were meeting together daily and they were having meals together and they were singing and worshiping God and they were filled with joy and gladness, it says that the outsiders saw them and they were being added to the church daily, such as should be saved. See, what happens is that when people see the loving relationships in the family of God the way it ought to be, they say, I want that. I need that. They're not just saying, hey, I don't want to go to church because church is boring and it's lifeless and it's dead. They're like, whoa, there's something happening there, something that I need in my life. The church is not a service. It's the family of God. And when we love each other with the love of Christ, the church becomes attractive to those that are in the world. There are so many lonely people, so many lonely people. They may even be married and have kids, but they're lonely. I remember one woman several years ago telling me she raised a family. Her kids have grown and gone to other states. And she said to me, she said, Pastor, the church is now my family. The church is now my family. There are so many people that need what the church is. The family of God, a loving community of grace and faith. And we need to show that to the world. Amen. And being a part of a church family helps us to grow in love for others. And that's the second greatest purpose. Amen. Jesus said the second greatest commandment is this, that you would love one another or love your neighbor as yourself. And the truth is, you know, it's very easy in this world to become self-centered. But being a part of a church family stretches us to grow in love. How does it stretch us to grow in love? Because we are all imperfect people. Amen. And I put both hands up on that. Amen. We are all imperfect people. We are broken people. But we are family. And because we are imperfect, broken people, there are times that we're going to do or say things that hurt or offend one another. But we are family. We love each other. And the Bible says love covers a multitude of faults. You know, we may have natural family members, right? A mother, a father, a brother, a sister in the natural, our, our natural family. And sometimes they do stuff to hurt us. Amen? But you just don't walk away from your family and say, well, you offended me. You are no longer my brother. Well, a few people may do that, but that's not the right thing to do. You know, we're family. And so I, I hope she's not listening, but I have a sister that's very hard to get along with. My whole family knows that. <laughs> very, my whole family has a hard time getting along with her. But you know what? She's my sister. Yes. Yes. And I'm not going to disown her because it's difficult to deal with her. I'm going to keep loving her. All right? And I hope she doesn't hear this broadcast. Amen. <laughs> But you know what? Growth really takes place when we're uncomfortable. And being a part of a church family takes us out of our comfort zone. And it stretches us to love people who are different from us, to love people who are imperfect, who don't always think like we think, who don't always act like we think that they should act. 
but being a part of a church family stretches us to embrace and to love broken and imperfect people and to forgive those who may hurt or offend us just like Jesus has forgiven us. Amen? So when we learn to love others, guess what? We are becoming more like Jesus. And when we learn to love people who hurt us, offend us, fail us, disappoint us, that's what Jesus did for us. So we're becoming more like him. And that's the goal of the Christian life. And being a part of a church family helps us to grow spiritually mature. This is called discipleship. And you know what? You can't disciple yourself. I'm sorry. You can't. Discipleship is an, a relational process. It is a relational process. It's not a personal pursuit. It takes place in the context of relationship. Just as Jesus called 12 to be with him, and by virtue of being with him, they were also with each other. Everywhere he went, the 12 of them went. And I'm sure because some of them, you know, they had a strong personality. Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth. Give me some ketchup with my toes. He was always saying the wrong thing. And then there were the sons of thunder who had a bad temper. And on one, one occasion when they didn't want to receive Jesus, he wanted to call down. They wanted to call down fire out of heaven. So I can just imagine. And then there was doubting Thomas who questioned everything. So I can just imagine there were times when the disciples got on each other's nerves where they offended each other. But you know what? Jesus called the 12 of them together to be with him and to be with each other and being with each other and, and learning to deal with the differences and difficulties of those relationships was a part of the discipleship process to help them grow more like Jesus. Discipleship is a people-to-people -people transfer of the faith from one person to another. Listen to this in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. This is Paul speaking. He said, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. It's not about just receiving a message, but it's about the relationships that we build. We are discipled by being in relationship with one another and by being in relationship with our spiritual leaders. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. In fact, the context of what we read as our, our main text for this message in Ephesians 4, when it says that we are all fitted together by Christ and by what each joint supplies, we grow and make increase of the church in love. It is in the context of the fact that God has given to the church the gift of prophets, po apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We grow as we are in relationship with our spiritual leaders that God has given as a gift to the church to help us come to spiritual maturity. So we are discipled not only by hearing sermons because we can listen to anybody. Nowadays on the internet, you can listen to anybody, anytime, online. But we are discipled by being in relationship with our spiritual leaders by being in relationship with our spiritual leaders, by getting to know them, by seeing their life, by letting them know us, by speaking with them and receiving godly guidance, by having them pray for us, by having them hold us accountable. We are discipled by watching their lives, by knowing them, by walking through life's journey with them and seeing how they deal with difficulties and trials. Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You see, Paul spoke of the importance in Timothy. He spoke of the importance of spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers for younger believers. Folks, we need to take the younger generation under our wing. We need to build those intergenerational relationships. And young people... You need the older people in your life. I know there's a thinking nowadays that uh, young people don't think they need older people, but you need spiritual mothers and fathers in your life. And to have spiritual mothers and fathers and to be a spiritual mother or father to someone, guess what? That requires personal relationship. You can't do that from a distance. But discipleship also takes place 
in our lives in small groups, over a cup of coffee at a lunch with a brother or sister in Christ, where we can connect and we can share our struggles that we're going through, where we can hear how others have dealt with similar issues, where others can speak the truth uh, 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 in love into our lives, and we can be prayed for and we can be encouraged. And in those relationships, that's how we grow up into maturity. That's what he tells us in Ephesians 4. That's how we grow up into maturity. And to contribute our gifts for the well-being of our church family, of our spiritual family, that's also what helps us to grow spiritually. Christians were never meant to be consumers. We are called to be contributors to the family of God, to the church. We are called to come to church, not with a what can I get out of it mentality, but how can I be a blessing to others? How can God use me to minister to others? We are called to serve. Guess what? You can't serve by yourself. You'll just be self-serving. God doesn't call us to serve self. He calls us to serve Others to use our gifts, our talents, our abilities to minister, to meet the needs of others, to encourage others, to help others. First Peter 4.10, the Living Bible says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Each. There's no one here that can say, I don't have anything that God can use. I don't have anything that I can give to the body of Christ. If we say that, we're calling God a liar. Because he says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Then listen to what he says. Be sure to use them to help each other. Be sure to use them to help each other. That's a part of our spiritual growth process. If you sit at home in your living room, how are you using your gifts to bless the body of Christ? How are you using your gifts to serve anybody else? You, you can't. You have, that, it's relational. You have to be connected to other people to be able to use your gifts to minister. And it brings so much joy and fulfillment when we can use our gifts to benefit the body of Christ and we see God using us to touch the lives of others. And there is an aspect of our spiritual growth that we cannot experience except through being involved in ministry in the body of Christ. In Ephesians 4.16, verse we read when we opened our service, says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. God doesn't make any mistakes. He puts you in this body. You have certain gifts, talents, and abilities that are needed in this body. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. There's a work that only you can do, and if you don't step up to do it, that's going to be lacking in the body of Christ. Somebody is going to go without being ministered to because that was lacking. It says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. He has put you in this church body to fulfill a particular work. And when we each do our part, the whole body grows and the whole body is healthy. And if you're not yet involved in ministry, I encourage you to get involved. If you want to get involved, just go to our website, nl-fl.org, click the volunteer tab, fill out the form, and somebody will get in touch with you, and we will try to get you connected in ministry so you can use your special gifts that God has given you to minister to the body of Christ. But being an active member of the church, the body of Christ, is essential to our spiritual growth, and there are so many benefits, so many blessings of being a part of a local family of God. The church is not a place we go or an event that we attend, but it is being a part of a spiritual family. Now that spiritual family will gather together in a particular place to fellowship, to learn, to grow, to minister to one another. But we are a spiritual family. From an elderly lady whose family had grown and gone off who said, the church is my family now, to a young girl in an abusive family who found a spiritual mother in a children's church worker, to a 
foreigner to this country dying of cancer and having the church be the ones who were with her in her last hours. The church is the family of God. It is God's gift of grace in each of our lives to help meet the deepest needs of our life and to enable us to fulfill his purpose for us by using our gifts to minister to others. The church is a loving community of grace that will accept you the way you are, but they will also help you become who God is calling you to be. This is the family of God. We love you and you belong here. And we encourage you to get connected to the family of God. But the first step to becoming a part of God's family is to be born again. We read earlier a scripture that says we have been given the privilege of being born again and becoming a part of God's family. How do we become born again? By repenting of our sins and placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we are all sinners, and sin has broken our relationship with God. It separated us from God. And that's the reason that Jesus came from heaven to earth, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross. So that when we repent of our sins and place our faith in him, we can be forgiven. We can be brought back into relationship with God. We can become a child of God and become a part of his family. And I want to encourage you, if you have not yet given your heart to Christ, or maybe you did so several years ago and you've drifted away, but you can feel the Holy Spirit tugging at you, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me as it's just a simple prayer of repentance and placing our faith in Christ. And as you do it in faith, God is going to forgive you, you will be born again, and you will become a part of his family. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, and I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I repent. I turn away from my sinful life, and I turn to you. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I invite you to come live inside of me. Help me from this day forward to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to congratulate you. That's the best decision that you've ever made, and I want to welcome you to the family of God. If you just prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you right now to just text, I prayed, to the number on the screen. We want to send you free a little e-booklet. If you're listening uh, by live stream, just type, I prayed, in the comments. And uh, we're going to send you later today a little message with a link. Click on that link, fill in your name and email address. We want to send you free of charge a little e-booklet that is going to help you understand the prayer you just prayed. And it's also going to help you know the next steps to continue growing in your relationship with the Lord. Because that prayer is a beginning, not an end. So please do that right now. Text I prayed to the number on the screen. If you're in-house, type I prayed. If you're listening by, uh, by uh, live stream. And a little later today, be sure to check your messages and fill in that form. But in the meantime, I want to encourage you to do three things, which every Christians should be doing on a daily basis, but it particularly I want to encourage those who just accepted Christ. One, talk to God every day. That's called prayer. Thank him for the good things in your life because every good thing is a blessing from God. And then talk to him about whatever needs or problems or decisions that you're making and ask his help. Secondly, let God talk to you every day in the way that he talks to us is through the Bible. If you don't have a printed Bible, you can download the YouVersion app on your phone or on your tablet. It's free of charge, and you can read as much as you want. There's never a charge. Start reading in 1 John. Read a few verses every day. Before you read, ask God to help you understand what you're reading and what he's saying to you. What you don't understand, put it to the side. What you need to understand it, God will help you. What you do understand, ask God to help you apply it to your life. Do that every day. And then thirdly, get connected to a local church family, which is what we've been talking about this morning. If you're here in South Florida, of course, we invite you to be a part of our New Life Church family. We love you and would love to have you as a part of our family. If you're outside of this area, please find a local Assembly of God church and get connected there. But once again, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. For all of us who have already placed our faith in Christ, 
The church is God's idea. It is his gift of grace to us. And it is essential for our spiritual growth. And it provides so many blessings to our lives, a few of which we've spoken about today. So I ask you, are you an active member of the family of God? Are you connected relationally? Are you using your gifts to serve the Lord? Do you regularly participate in worship together with the church gathered? Are you building relationships within the church family that extend beyond the church service? Are you doing life together and ministering to one another? Today, God is calling us to be active members of the family of God. And if you'll respond in obedience to his word and the work of the spirit and say, yes, I will actively take my place in the family of God and regularly participate in family life. If that's your heart's desire, would you stand right where you are, here and at home? And let's just pray a prayer of commitment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You talk to God from your own heart as I pray over us today. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you so much for the gift of your church, the blessing of having a church family. Thank you that we don't have to do life alone, but you have provided us with a spiritual family to walk along this journey with and so that we can enjoy life together, that we can encourage one another and we can be a blessing to each other. Today, we stand before you to commit to actively participate in our church family, to regularly gather together in worship, to build relationships with one another that extend beyond the church services, and to use our gifts and talents to be a blessing and to minister to others. And as we do, Lord God, help each of us grow and help our church family to grow and to be healthy, Lord God. Help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to not soon forget this message or our response, but that we will live out the commitment that we make to you today to be an active part of our church family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.